Well, welcome back to the program. It is uh, up front here, Sam Edmund. It is a Sunday, believe it or not, the 29th of October, and we're sitting in the SEN studios for reasons that will become apparent in the moment. The Melbourne Footy Club have been the topic of uh, conversation since the end of the season, and probably before, to be honest. Premiership in 2021, from a home away point of view, top four 2022, 2023, without a win in the finals. And right now, they've been described, amongst other things, as the dysfunctional problem child of the AFL, which mm. is hard. To say, as someone whose footy club is very dear and close to my heart and the coach of the Melbourne Footy Club, Simon Goulden, the CEO, Gary Pert, have had to endure all of this and in lots of instances been the subject of much rumour and innuendo and I think they've had enough. So uh, here they are, Goody and Purdy, welcome to SEN and what are you here for on the 29th of October on a Sunday when you should be on a beach somewhere? Uh, Gary, Sam, good to be here first of all, but you know, clearly we're here you know, because of what you've just spoken about, it's a, a situation that we don't feel comfortable in and we want to address some of the things that are they're out there floating around and be really upfront and honest with our supporters and, and really talk openly from the heart about what is going on at our footy club and, and where we're going to take it and how we're going to go forward. So culture has been, just, you know, the heart of this. You've got player issues that we can get to and, you, you know, given the uh, restraints we have around medical issues. You can talk as openly as you possibly can. Clayton Oliver's a player, obviously, we're going to discuss. Joel Smith, amongst others. But have you got a cultural footy uh, problem at your footy club, Goody? No, we haven't got a cultural problem. We've got some isolated incidents that we are going to deal with to help drive our culture forward. Um, you know, for 10 years now, we've worked on a, building a high-performing culture. Uh, we've made decisions in and around our footy club over a long period of time to build the best footy club we can to perform to the highest level. And we've been able to do that um, right to the extent where we won a premiership in 21. We've been able to continue to do that and finish in the top four the last couple of years. Um, currently, right now, we've got some isolated incidents. And when I present culture to our footy team, it sits above everything we do in our footy club, ahead of X's and O's, ahead of the strategy of what we do. Without a good, strong culture, a high-performing culture, you can't have success. Alignment in behaviour is critical. It doesn't mean it won't be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. It's always ongoing. And currently we sit here, we've got some isolated incidents that on the back of each other would look like we've got some trouble at our footy club. But we haven't got the trouble that people think we've got. We've got an amazing high-performing culture in terms of the people and the leadership that have driven this footy club for 10 years now. And we're going to use the opportunity of these isolated incidents that we're dealing with to continue to grow and enhance that. We need it to be at the very highest level for the highest success. And that's what we're going to go about doing. People would nearly drive off the road with respect mm -hmm. and suggest that you're in denial. When you sit here on the back of where your club's at, you know, performances when it matter most, high performance when it matters most is in September. On those issues that we've been talking about and you again sit here and tell me that the culture is strong at the football club. Yeah, I understand that people would think that, but you don't get into a position where, um, you know, finishing top four in a competition without having a high performing culture. And we have, we've, we've got, we've built a culture that is about hard work. It's about being competitive. It's about being unified in our approach. And as I said, it, it doesn't mean you, you, you're going to be perfect in everything we do. And we haven't been perfect in everything we've done. We're not in denial about that. We've got some imperfections that we need to sort out, but it sits at the, at the top of what we do. And we are going to use these examples and we are going to clean up some of the things that we've done to make sure that we actually can forge ahead and have the success that we're looking for. But we are putting ourselves consistently in positions for success at our footy club. And that's something we should be really proud of. Um, but that, as I said, it doesn't mean that we haven't got some things that we need to address, iron out and get better. From your own point of view, Goody, is your name continually gets dra uh, dragged into this and has done, you know, over the past three or four years. And you know, as brutal as it is, your name has been linked to an illicit drug problem. Have you, since you've been a coach of this football club, had an issue with illicit drugs? Never. And I've said this over a three-year period now, and it's pretty ordinary that I'm actually sitting in this position and having to justify um, that situation. Um, I know where it started in terms of a rumour from down in the Mornington Peninsula, and that was clearly going around. And um, that was, for me, really concerning and bizarre at the time. It then led to an allegation, an allegation that was fully investigated by Gary 
and the club across here about what that might look like. And it, it was nothing in it. Um, I do not use illicit drugs. Um, I give everything I can to my family, my team, um, in a way that dedicates my life to our footy club. Um, and to have this play out over a three year period where my reputation has been caught up in a boardroom battle, it's been well documented. It's been documented over and over and over again in the public. Um, it's been really hard. Um, it's taken its toll on myself, my family, everyone. Um, and enough's enough. I, I don't use illicit drugs and I, I never will. How hard has it been? I mean, I'm, I'm delving into the personal here, but with not just for you, because it's hard for you, but you live in the public light for those that don't, that you just touched on. Yeah. And no, I understand that in the public light, you're going to have rumors spoken about you and that's the world we live in. I'm sure you've, you've had them before Gary and, and everyone that goes down that path. But when it's such a sustained period of time and, um, there's no fact to the rumor. Um, it is really tough on your family. And as I said, I, I love the game. I'm passionate about our footy club. I'm passionate about football. Um, and I've led my club to a really high level over a 10 year period. And I'm incredibly proud of that. I'm going to continue to do that. I certainly don't condone illicit drugs. Um, and it's been widely accused that I've got a behavioral and lifestyle that's not acceptable. Do I enjoy having a, a beer and a punt? Um, and a glass of wine with mates. Yeah, of course I do. I'm a, I'm a pretty straightforward type of guy, Gaz, you know that. Um, but I live my life in a way that really is a dedicated approach to my, my career, my football club and my family. And, um, you know, the rumors have to stop. Um, it's got way out of control from a boardroom battle into court documents, into republication, rehashing, rehashing of a story over and over again to an extent where it's become a fact, um, which is just not fair. And it's gone from a rumor to an allegation to a fact, and it's got to stop. Um, I've had enough, and I think as an industry, we need to be better than what we are today. Um, we're, we're starting to really hurt people in this game too much through this period of time. Documents have been circulated, reported on in the paper here in Melbourne, Purdy, of which you've been attributed to saying, yes, we will look into this. Yes, we've had, you know, again, I'm paraphrasing here. I can read it, refute it. You're comfortable with the whole process over the past two years in terms of, you know, the behaviours and otherwise of your coach, investigated, as Simon has said, put it to bed in your own mind and not revisited it. Um, I'm not comfortable. I'm disgusted, really, about what's played out over the last three years. Um, three years ago, there was rumours going around like we have. We've all been in the industry a long time and when rumours pop up, and I've, I've done this at the club with other rumours as well, we check them out, we take them the full length to establish whether we have any issues. For three years now, I've been saying this has been fully investigated. Every single person that was actually spreading this rumour at the time I spoke to and all of them said the same thing. Well, I'm only passing on what I got told by someone else. And so I'd go back through the chain and took it all the way back to what seemed to be where it started from. And the one or two people where it started from all said, we haven't referred to drugs. We, we were referring to the fact that Simon was down at the Mornington Peninsula at the Sorrento Hotel with some of our senior players. Now, they were living there at the time because we were training at Casey Field and they were having a beer and a bet on the races at times, and that's literally where it got to. Now, I've made it very clear publicly for three years, and, and I'd presented that to the board at the time when I said I'd investigate it. Glenn Bartlett, who was the head of the board and the rest of the board, signed off on that and uh, accepted there was no further action required. There's been no new information. There's been no new people come forward, so nothing's changed in that period of time, and it's really been... Uh, one, it's been disgusting uh, to watch it play out. And two, I've felt really quite helpless to watch Goody go through this. And um, he, he hasn't talked about it a lot because uh, I know it's something that's really difficult, but I've also watched how the whole family's had to wear these constant um, attacks and how that ripples out. So... Um, it is really something that's got to stop. There's been no facts. There's been no merit. There's been no substance to it at any stage. 
And like I said, I think we've all seen rumours in the industry at different times and they might flare up for a week or two. I've never seen it carry on like this for three years. Has Gil McLa- the former CEO Gil McLaughlin added to this? And I'll quote um, from these reports and you can tell me otherwise. He, added, he told Pert that it was the talk of the town. When you're boozing at the pub and betting with your playing group, 20-year-old blokes think that's odd. Coaches of amateur leagues wouldn't do that. He said a lot of club boards worried about who's going to take over but stressed that Melbourne. So is, did he add to these problems? Oh, well, it certainly doesn't help um, the AFL CEO saying at the time, especially because I totally disagree with him and I said that at the time. Um, if our players were not wanting to have a beer with the coach because they don't have a relationship with him, especially when they're living in the same suburb over summer, I'd have an issue with that. Um, the fact that Simon's down, my biggest problem with Simon, I'll tell you right now, is he's too focused on his footy, he spends too much time on it, he, he, he just sits there and all the coaches are the same, they're just, their lives are obsessed with it and I want there to be balance, it's the only way that you have a long career in the game and, and as a head coach, you're totally absorbed by it, you can't walk anywhere else, people talking about it, so... Um, I made that very clear to Gill at the time. I do not have a problem with the head coach going to what is his local pub, which is run by one of his best mates, and having a drink with two of the most responsible, sensible players we've got, senior players, and uh, I love the fact that that happens. It's hard to talk about goody because you're here, but Mm. you've come in because you want to put a stop to it, and we appreciate and respect that. And you've done that. And you did it three years ago and you've done it again. Mm. When when there are constant reports coming out, Purdy, via a particular newspaper, the, the questions need to be addressed. So did it ever get to a stage where you put a contingency place in, um, scenario, I think it was called scenario planning, scenario planning yeah. for the removal or replacement of, of Simon Goodman as senior coach? So w- what comes out is it would be standard practice, which is at any particular uh, stage, the, the governance of a club that we think of possibilities. And it was a very simple conversation, which was if we have a problem with a senior leader within the club, and it was raised um, at a board level confidentially to say, what if we did have a problem? And you go through the contingencies, that's good governance. And that, that would apply to any anyone. The fact that there was no requirement for it because the investigation proved that there was no facts and no merit. It was just, right. it died and it was never ever talked about again. A contingency in the case of you do your investigation, there needs to be something addressed. You've done your investigation, no corroborating evidence, no evidence whatsoever, so not needed. And that was agreed to and signed off by the board at the time and nothing's changed in the last three years. So that's why it's so frustrating. Mm. And, and all the people, everyone knows, the third parties that have been driving this for three years, all of them for three years have been very aware that there's no substance and fact in this whatsoever, and they continue to drive it. Simon, we spoke about illicit drugs broadly uh, pertaining to you, an individual at your football club who's um, well known to everyone. His name's Clayton Oliver. He's got a long and lucrative contract ahead of him. Can I ask you pointedly, does Clayton Oliver have an illicit substance problem? Clayton Oliver's got some personal challenges. And that's the best way we can describe it. It's a very complex situation that we've got going on with Clayton. And clearly those challenges have been going ongoing for multiple years. Um, this is something that hasn't just reared its head in recent times. This is something that's been ongoing for our footy club and ongoing for our, our team um, for a number of years. And um, we're working incredibly closely with Clayton right now um, and building the best people around him and care around him to deal with his complex personal issues. Um, but what Clayton needs to be really clear on is that we now have some minimum standards of behaviour that we want him to adhere to. Um, and if he can't come along with our culture, there will be some consequences that come with that. And we need to be in a position where we can drive our high performance culture. And Clayton's a big part of that. And he'll either come with us because there's teams that have great behaviour, great clarity on what's expected, great behaviours ultimately have success. And it, it, there's no individual that's above that. And, and we're going to build that around Clayton. So if these personal challenges have been ongoing over a, a, you know two to three years, as you say, why has it seemingly come to a head in 2023? Well, it, it really is a matter of a lot of what we deal with, if it's dealt with internally and no one knows about it and it's not being talked about in the media, 
um, then it doesn't mean that we haven't been dealing with it. It's been a constant challenge. So that's been and happening over at, time. Yeah, over a long period of time. And as Simon said, that Clayton has his own support people and, and our people are part of that as well. But it really does come down to the, the very first question that Gary asked, which is, do we have a cultural problem? And, and people have got to understand what culture is about. So that, that's what we're dealing with now is we're dealing with isolated behavioural issues where individuals are being held to account. And when you have a cultural issue, that's about do you have the leaders and do you have the leadership programs and do you have the standards and disciplines and do you have the accountability these are programs that are in place, and I've got to say, I've, I've been in the game now for 40 years. Our, our culture at the club, our men and women's programs, is the best I've seen in 40 years, and that's because of the people, the leadership, um, the, the clarity and strength and resilience of that culture. So these behavioural issues will be held to account by those leaders because everyone's so clear on the standards of disciplines and expectations. And Clayton might be viewed by some, which would be really valid to go arguably our best player. But our best player and our first year recruit are held accountable to the same standards and disciplines. We make no apology for that. And recently we have made clear to Clayton and his management that he is being held accountable and that needs to be uh, tightened up. And not only for Clayton, but all the players that are living and breathing that culture every day need to see that everyone's held accountable, and that's what's playing out. I'm not buying it. I'm sorry uh, to both of you. Um, so you, you're telling me the football club is the best culture you've seen in your 40 years of footy. You've been involved in a lot of good football clubs over the journey, and Goody, you and I have had one one animated blue in recent times and you're telling me that you've got a high performance culture i'm not i, I can't sorry as a footy i'm i'm representative of a melbourne footy club supporter base right now who are going i'm not i'm not buying that i mean i'm i hear what you're saying but it doesn't play out that way when i'm seeing incidents here incidents there um the way that we played in the back half of your, your discipline you know the blues going back so all of these add up to me is not a 40-year best standard culture, I'm sorry. You can try and convince me otherwise, but I'm, I'm not having it. Um, but I'm not trying to convince you, and I know that the supporters don't like seeing our players in the media like this, as we don't. Um, and there'll be a certain percentage that'll say, I don't buy into it, and that's because they don't understand how a football club works and a high-performance environment I think I do. works. I think I do. Yeah, but we're, when we're looking at this and we're going, particular behaviours are all being lumped in when they're completely unrelated. And you know what? It's just a cop-out to actually say individual behaviours are a result of Max Gorn, Jack Viney, Christian Petrarca, Jake Lever, Alex Neil Bullen, who are our leadership team that have built that culture. They've built the standards and disciplines. They've held players accountable, including themselves, for the last three or four years that you guys don't know about in the media, but they're holding each other accountable. And that's what's driven the performance. So there's two parts to this. There's a commitment to excellence and performance on field, and there's living the values and standards and mm. behaviours. So these guys, when we lump it into the culture, we're saying these guys are failing. And, and I don't cop that because you know what else it does in a high-performance environment? It lets the individuals off the hook that aren't living no, the standards true. and disciplines. No, I accept and, that. And uh, I'm not directing that at Max and those leaders because I know what they no, do. But, but we fly but together and we fall together. No, 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 no. But you are. Because when you say we have a cultural issue, you're talking about Alan Richardson. You're talking about Simon Goodwin, who are two of, if not the best cultural leaders that I've worked with. They are obsessed about our culture. Over the top of, we're not going to win a premiership by having superstars in every uh, position. We're going to win it because of our line culture. And that's driven by Goody every single day. I've never seen a coach drive the standards and disciplines and the values and the culture like Goody. Never, ever seen it. it. would just be far in excess of any other coach. And Alan Richardson's the same. So when you put a question mark on the culture, you put a question mark on Goody and Richo and Max and Jack okay, and all those okay. players. And, and I don't cop that no, because I look at the decisions that are being made and I, I've got more detail, obviously, on the decisions that are being made. And I go, those individuals are accountable and they've got to deal with it. Some of them may be for a long period of time, the decisions they're making. I appreciate that. And 
I, I admire the fact that you go into bat and the, you're good. You're here, but I, I then go. Well, this is a team capable of more, and this is a team who have got to a situation and put themselves in contention and not been able to finish. And maybe it is only. Uh, Purdy, maybe it is only a percent. Maybe it is only two or three or four percent of cultural strength yeah, but, that hasn't yeah. been able to get this footy club I, to where they and, need to and be. And I know people do that, and we lift ourselves open to that, right? Because right. we haven't won finals right. over the last two years. Right. So you leave yourself but open you have to got, it. You have got behavioural. But we that, have not isolated lost those or not, games. There are behavioural issues, and we'll get to Joe in a moment. No, no, okay, no. no, but, okay, no, yeah. no our culture is great and strong, and that. I go, hang on. We've got a player. I know it's in the. I don't know what you can say and what you can't say. We've got a player who's tested positive on the eve of a final series. Yeah, but you, you've moved off what you're talking about, well, which is part, not delivering. Well, no, it doesn't. It's it because, doesn't. Well, all of those elements do, but what you brought up is not delivering in finals. Now, part we of. missed we missed those finals by a kick I, I know. here and there. We were in a position to do it. We we know we could have won those finals and we put ourselves in a position and we didn't get there. But that's and, a Steve and May scenario and, with all due respect. Don't come to me after the grand final and say we were so much better than Collingwood and would have kicked their ass. That, that's not washing. Well, see, and, and again, you're bringing all these different things into it. Our job is is to look at what's real and what we actually have to deal with. And did we lose those games because of a lack of leadership? Did we lose it because of our culture? Did we lose it for... No, Right. We accept that teams, finals, we love finals because it's not about who the best team is. It's the best team on the day. And we look at Collingwood, we look at Carlton and they got it done on the day. We were, we put ourselves into a position for the third year in a row. This is a team that has been in the top eight every single round for three years, been in the top four for three years running, yep. won a premiership in recent times. We've we've recently this one, this year just won the McClellan Trophy, which is a trophy designed yes. by the AFL to yes. go. This is the best performing club in the competition. Yes. If it was running for the last three years, we would have won it the last three mm. years. So do, do you win those things? I go back without actually having strong leaders and cultures in both our men's and women's program. That is a line from the board through myself, through Ellen and Simon, and through our player leadership. You you do not win those things. You do not have su sustained success. Now, if we had have kicked a goal in the last quarter here or if we didn't drop a mark in the second quarter, that's that's the game day you've yeah. got to deliver well, on can, the but day. But that's not a cultural if issue. If Cosie Pickett hadn't done this and if he hadn't given that, I can go back to all those isolators. That's right. So they might be the elements of within what we stand for as a footy club and what we are. Hey, what we stand for right now is good enough up to a point. Yeah. And, it, it, we and, and up to a point, it's been great, but it hasn't got to where we needed to be. No, we, we, it, we've got a cultural issue. If when players don't behave, it's because they don't understand or they're not clear or that we don't hold them account, then we've got a cultural okay. issue. And our players understand and, and think of the recent publicity about the behaviour of players. They fully understand they're stepping outside our standards and disciplines. And they fully understand and have felt it, the accountability from our football department leadership group, and that'll continue. And so time that's will why, tell. That's why it's a behavioural issue. And time has told. The last three years has told and shown. To a point. We're sick, and, we're sick and tired. Well, winning a premiership in the last three years is... Is not no, no, I mean, I, you know, I'm an advocate for a statue don't, yeah. don't, because of what Simon's delivered. But that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't say let's put that in the bank and therefore all is good in the world. No, it, quite the, the opposite. And I'll, I'll direct, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, yeah, the debate. <laughs> and, and, co and just to back, uh, culture's ongoing. So we've got to keep making sure we work on it weekly, monthly, hmm. all the time to get to where we're going to. And you're right. It could be the difference between the next premiership at the Melbourne Footy Club. We need to look at it and say, what are some of the things we need to do, whether it be strategic, culturally, uh, the way we train to take ourselves to the next level. But we have to be, to get yourself in a position, you've got to have a strong culture and we have that to take it to the next level. And once you get that ultimate success, you get all the praise for your culture possible, whether it be Richmond through their era about their unity and their connection, whether it be Melbourne in 21 with their selflessness, whether it be Collingwood this year around their inclusiveness and their mm. people and their mm. ability to all buy into certain things. You get that ultimate credit under the ultimate success. You don't win. There's always criticism. Yeah. There's always things that aren't quite right. And there's always opportunities that sit within it to go, hang on, 
we can actually go to another level here. And that's our challenge. So with all that in mind, can we go back specifically to, to Clayton for a second? In hindsight, did you protect him too much? Can you help us understand? I asked that knowing that there may have been external advice to do exactly that, but can you help the listeners understand what the personal challenges mean? How has it got to this position? And, and did you protect him too much looking back? Um, I reckon it's a really good question. And it's one that we've been, uh, we've been thinking about and we've been talking to people within his uh, uh, support team. And the reality is, like I said, this has been going over a long period of time. And we've tried and continue to all different ways of supporting him at different times. And from an element of tough love, because it is like a big family in a lot of ways, I mean, Goody's relationship with Clary and, and so many of the other players, what they've been through together, you, you you do care so much for them and you're trying to do everything to give them every chance. And we're talking about a player that um, we can't ever forget while he's been going through these personal challenges with us, He's also arguably in his first 150 games the most highest performing player in the history of the club. Mm. So we've done a lot right to al allow him the support to play on field and to deal with the off field. Um, but maybe right at the moment, um, a firmer, clearer, tough love approach based on uh, expert advice coming through is more appropriate for where we're at right now and it, it, I think it's important for the entire player group to see that as well. At any stage, did you talk about trading Clayton Oliver? No, we didn't consider trading Clayton Oliver. It came up as a period of time where we were working with Clayton um, to really buy into the, the, the behaviours that we're looking for from him um, and it all culminated at once. Um, and that's why the club didn't speak for two or three days. There were these rumours going around about trade, but we were wanting to get a real clear commitment from Clayton that he was prepared to do the work, to buy into the, the standards and the behaviours and the minimum things that we were looking for, and to really want to be a part of the Melbourne Footy Club. And, and in, in the end, he, he did. He wanted to be a part of where we're going, and we're going to work with him to do that. Um, so that's why it played out that way. But we weren't in a we weren't in a position where we wanted to trade Clayton Oliver. But since that buy-in, he's obviously had a hospital episode. So is it a day to day? Is it a week to week proposition with Clayton? I mean, can you sit here and make any sort of guarantees about next year, about the next six years after that? Mm. And, and again, um, we 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 communicated to our supporters what what actually happened with him going to hospital, and and that was reflective of the challenges that we deal with him. Um, but it certainly wasn't uh, reflective of a lot of the comment that was in the media or rumours that was out there, quite the opposite. Um, so hopefully we, uh, we clarified that. But is that a reflection of some of the mm. challenges we have? Yes, it is. So with, and I'm, get, we just get back to Max, for instance, and Jack and Christian and, you know, the Neil Bullens who, you know, we love and got great respect for, for the, how difficult is it for them then when you've got a situation like Clayton or, you know, others where they've got to stand up and set a standard and drive a standard? As a leader, I'm thinking, right, you know, back in the day, you're captain of your footy club and you're going, this is what we are, this is where we're going to be and this is what we stand for. And then, you know, the best player, the generational talent, the best players 150 years, for whatever reason, can't meet that standard. Whether they And I, under, and I appreciate the medical complexity. So I, this is not an issue that people think it is, maybe part of, I'm not sure. But how can you stand up there and drive that stand and say this, this, and this, and this, and then if one can't quite get there, how, how do you deal with that then as a leader? And I think that's what's the, the shift that's going to be taking place is these guys are driving such a high-performing culture. These guys buy in and drive it and role model what we're looking for to a really high level. And right now they're, they're second-guessing themselves. They've got all the external noise going on around our footy club, around poor culture and and what do we stand for? And that, and that, they deep down they know what they what we stand for. But this gives them an opportunity to really reestablish this. We want to be clear about what we stand for, and we don't want to sit here. I don't need to sit here and convince you, Gary, and talk to you. We want to show you. We want to bring our supporters on the journey with you. We're going to open up our footy club to our supporters, open up to the media, and sh and show you, and so people can see the type of footy club that we are and that we want to be moving forward. And that's what we, that's our opportunities in front of us for, for myself, 
for Max, for Jack, for Alex, for Angus, for Christian, for everyone to come in, welcome you into our footy club and actually show you. We don't want to talk about it. We don't, mm. I, don't, I don't want to sit here and have to convince you that we've got a good culture. I actually want to show you. Mm. And that starts when? Well, it started right now. That's why we're sitting here today. Right. You know, we want to open ourselves up. Right. We want to be really clear about where we're at, be honest, and come and show you and take you on a journey. I don't want to sit here and talk to you and convince you. I'm not going to be able to do that. Mm. All right. We need to show you. And mm. the, the way we'll show you is through bringing you on that journey with us. And, and Gary, I take it back. These are the exact same guys that after 2020 said enough's enough and we're going to hold ourselves accountable. We're going to have the hold the other players accountable. We're going to build a new culture and program and we're going to commit it a different – these are the exact same players. Yep. And said and, – and so like what he's saying, when you deliver the premiership in 2021, people go, we'll laud you for the, the culture that you've created right now. Now, that happened back then. And these are the same guys driving that. And and I, I, I think the reason why they find it easier, if you like, to do it now is because they've seen the result of why it's so important to have that alignment and unity right through the group. So did we not handle it as well as we could have, the success of 2021, mm. and has that played out in 2022 and 23? What you're saying is, yes, let's make, we're not, enough's enough at the end of 2020, drive it through 2021, and now has the standard just dropped? No, 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 no. It's, no? Uh, no, culture's not an end point. It's a, it's a daily thing to keep in alignment. So it is. So this, same, it... Same, this, this same group has now got a different playing group. We're in a different dynamic. We've got different challenges. Um, we've got different competitive uh, forces against us, and but it's the same group that's going. The culture and the standards and disciplines and the alignment, which, like I said, we don't ever get to a point where we go, finally the, ki- the culture's done and we've won the premiership, we can sit back and relax. You can pretty well guarantee the next day and the next day something's going to change. So it's an ongoing thing. And you're backing in the leaders and you're backing in the program um, and it's not an end point. So have we got ahead of ourselves? I don't even know what that means in terms of if if we've yes, got... You, complete, you know what getting no, ahead of yourself but, means. No, you've got to look at it specifically. Go, would, does that mean that we've become complacent? Or well, not mean- even complacent, but in, in and you, you, you can jump in here. What drives you when you haven't had ultimate success you know what dry you dry yeah. you cause, and then you've got it you've got the metal around your neck and then you're going am i getting out of bed this am i going to go that am i going to run that extra you know what getting yeah and on. and that complacency can happen and and the indicator that we see if that ever happens is the work rate and the standards and disciplines drop off now did that happen after 2021 it's an easy throwaway line but did it happen um our results from the pre-season in 2022 were quite far in excess of 2021. So we had the opposite. Mm. We The work rate went through the roof and you actually had a group continue to commit. And and that would be supported if we won those games following. And when you don't, you open yourself up for people to go, I don't buy in. And that's what you were talking and that, about. And that's what we live, in, live by our industry. You know, you don't win finals and you don't have the ultimate success. People are always going to have that question. But, you know, as I said, we, we put ourselves in that position. We worked incredibly hard. We won 10 games straight after winning a flag. You, you don't do that if you're complacent. You don't do that if you're getting ahead of yourself. Mm. Um, but we haven't been able to get it done at the point. And we acknowledge that. We haven't, we haven't been able to win finals under the ultimate pressure when it mattered. And, and we'll go to work on that. There's obviously that process with Sport Integrity Australian. We both, Gary and I, realise you're bound by what you can and can't say in regards to Joel Smith. But what level of disappointment sits in you both that he's found himself in a position where he's you know, allegedly tested positive to an illicit substance days out from a game? Well, I can only go by how I feel. And I, when I first heard, um, I was incredibly angry, frustrated, um, to think that potentially we've got a player in round 23 on the eve of a final series, um, not doing everything possible to help the success of our footy team. And I can only imagine that same feeling would be permeating through our supporter base. And I haven't spoken to Joel. Um, I'm going to let the process play out. Why is that? Um, because I have, I've got a level of anger and frustration towards it. Um, there are the right people that are talking to, to Joel. 
um, from a welfare perspective and, and working really closely with him around that. But where I sit right now, I've, I've got a little bit of frustration because of everything we've just been speaking about, the, the, the behaviours and the culture of our footy club, what we were embarking on at the end of this season um, to potentially be in this situation. Um, I've got a bit of anger towards it. Has he tried to contact you? No. What are the players? How do they feel about it? And how I, mean, I can imagine exactly the same as yeah. myself. You know, our leadership group. You know, they're 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 really upset by it. You know, they 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 give everything they can to our footy club, um, and they were doing everything they could to give themselves the best crack at the ultimate success. And um, you know, they're disappointed. They're angry, um, and I guess we'll just work our way through it slowly as a footy club. Do you think? So we can broaden this out. I know it's been heavy, but that's what you're here for. Um, so then Harrison Petty, this is, I guess, what happens. is footy clubs and we're, we're in a competitive environment. Adelaide sense vulnerability maybe um, where we're at as a footy club. They identify what's going on and then they come hard for someone like Harrison Petty who, you know, we hope is going to be, or you guys hope, is going to be, sorry, the answer. Um, I'm keeping account. <laughs> so... Do you think that the level of uncertainty or the level of uh, controversy that has immersed the footy club in recent times, do you think that they that Adelaide looked upon this as an opportunity, played on that with Harrison, and and how far down the path did that get? Oh, that's just a part of our industry. No, no, I get it. You, I, I mean, that's you're going to target expect. good players and you're going to go after them, and um, you know that's what happens in trade period. It's what happens, you know, and we'll be, we'll be doing the same thing. But what clubs sense and what they feel, I'm not too sure. Um, how they go about it, but we're really confident with Harrison. He's a part of our footy club. He's really committed to our footy club. You know, I've had a, multiple conversations with Harrison through this period, and, and he knew exactly where that sat. Um, and you know, he's uh, he's hell bent on having a fantastic year as a key forward this year for our footy club. Just while we're broadening into the water side that Gary touched on there, Purdy. So, have you felt the need to contact the families of the rest of the playing group, particularly the younger players? Have, the, have some parents sought some assurance? What's going on? I mean, how does that look or, or none of the above? Um, no, we haven't. And I, I don't think we're required to. You know, I've been in contact with uh, some of the senior players. I've certainly been in contact with uh, Joel because I took the first call and had to manage it all the way through. Um, and, and I think that internally, so it's like with all these things, you see a lot of, um, you see a lot of controversy in the, the media and in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm, I'm not being uh, smart, but people are doing their job to sensationalise it and, and draw things together. Um, as a group, as a player group, they get it. I think Goody's articulated uh, really well where the player leadership group is that, you know, that... They're unbelievably disappointed and they're and uh, frustrated that this would bring question marks on so many good people at this particular time. Um, I'm not feeling that anyone really around the club is this seeing this as a reflection of anything that uh, um, is a broader issue. So your level of shock must have been absolute when Joel picks up the phone and tells you what's happened. Oh no, my fir- I, I got advised before Joel through right. the through the AFL, that's the process. Um, and then I have to organise for Joel to actually talk to the uh, sports integrity people in the AFL. So I've been heavily involved in this. Um, suffice to say, when I took the call, it was a uh, shock. You know, you're talking about a player that's really worked hard to get himself into a strong position in the uh, player group and, and someone that um, potentially has a really important role for us. Um, and then what gets presented to me on the call there, I've got, I got to be honest, I just literally cannot get my head around um, how we can be dealing with this. That being said, um, I think it's been made very clear to me that the process is not, we're not involved in the process mm. um, and we don't have any information to pass on to supporters. We're, we've been told from day one um, that this will play out with the mm. AFL and sports integrity. We'll be advised at the end of it and we're not allowed to communicate anything in the meantime. 
A couple of quick ones. Um, six eleven and something for Harley Reid. Do you, you get involved in this? Or do you, do you, you got other things on your mind? Uh, they got other things. Lammy, uh, Timmy Lamb, and um, Jace Taylor. I'm sure they're doing their best. But um, yeah, whatever happens there, we're really we're really comfortable with our draft hand. You know, we've got a fantastic hand to bring in some great kids um, to our footy club, and I think that brings a level of excitement for our supporter group. And um, you know, whatever that looks like, I'll be. Uh, I can't wait to get hold of them. And. Uh, I think time is just about against us, Sam. Unless just you want to wander one. into one other hour. Yes. The premiership jumper. Why are you selling the premiership <laughs> jumper, please? Oh, that's oh, a good gosh. question. There's, there's another one that got to be blown yeah, that, out of proportion. That, that got yeah, roped in. That yep. got roped in. Yeah, name 221. We Obviously, after the premiership, you, a lot of memorabilia. You work with a lot of people, boast uh, a premiership around memorabilia. And, and one of the questions was, mate, you got any old Adelaide gear that you want to get rid of? And I said, mate, go your hardest, you know, and gave it to him two years ago. And... Um, you know, he said, would you be interested in selling your premiership? I said, not really. Um, you know, I said, what do they normally go for? He said, oh, anywhere between five and ten grand. I said, mate, if you can get 20, go your hardest. If not, mate, I'll keep it. It's still at my house. Um, and, you know, what I, what, you know, I haven't really got a lot of interest, but that's been sitting online for two years. And now that's become a media story now. You know, if people are trying to build a case around certain things around me and my, my life, um, based off a of premiership jumper, be, I'm not the type of guy that walks into my house with memorabilia sitting around a wall. That's not me. I, I, when I go home, I just want to sit with my family and just be a dad. And um, I don't want to be a, a footy star. I've seen your, my I've seen your artwork too. I mean, there'd be no place for that <laughs> jumper to be honest. Um, you have to. Uh, you, so people would wonder why you're doing this on a Sunday. Uh, Goody, you got back from your holiday last night, late last night, and you're off to New Zealand for some personal development stuff with the All Blacks. I think is that tomorrow. Yeah, off to, uh, off tomorrow to New Zealand for for three days at the institute there in in Wellington, and really looking forward to you know catching up with some like minded people from coaching in a in a variety of different sports. Um, will be fantastic. It'll be with uh, with Gary, with Richo, and with Owen Griffiths, our high performance manager. So a great chance for the leaders of our footy club to come together, do some PD together, and strategize about what next year looks like. So we're really looking forward to that. Last message for the. Uh, Melbourne supporters, I think, are you talking to mostly this morning. But for the broader footy community, have you got a, a message to leave you with? Oh, leave look, with? I think, as we said right at the start of this, we we want to be as transparent as we can with all these issues. Uh, we ask the supporters to sort of listen to the communication from the club, not necessarily that's uh, 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 being uh, spilling around there, if you like. Um, and there's so many good things happening at the club, and I think we've just got to stay focused on that. It's, it's easy to be distracted, but as leaders, we look at each one of those um, scenarios and go, do we have broader issues or are we dealing with player behaviour issues and they need to be dealt as that, and that's how we're um, moving forward. You're not going to have to save anyone's life over in New Zealand as well. <laughs> I mean, there was one bit of good press. Yeah, that was one good bit of good press. And it's amazing how something get blown out of proportion. I, I don't think I saved his life. <laughs> good and bad. <laughs> I just got him to some safety where he could get his shoulder fixed. But uh, bizarre situation. But the young lad's in good shape. His shoulder's back in, his, in, in joint. Uh, good to hear. Um, as I said, uh, off the top, 29th of October is probably not what you'd want to be doing at this time of the year, but um, it was. I think it's important that you speak to it and we appreciate you both coming in. Yeah, Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us.